Welcome to DevRel Book Club. My name is Matthew Ravel and... I'm Ramon Huidobro. Welcome very much and uh, happy to be on once again to do another book club. Yeah, so this week we'll bring him in in a moment, but we are joined by Adam Devanda, who is someone you might have come across thanks to his book, Developer Marketing Does Not Exist. But this week we are not going to talk about Adam's book. We are going to talk about a book that has influenced him. And that book is The War of Art. Ramon, should we bring Adam in to... Uh, find out a bit more about him and the book that he's chosen. Yes, please. Very happy to have Adam join us today and tell us about The War of Art. Hey, Adam, welcome to the Devil Book Club. Yeah, thanks for having me. So where are you joining us from today? I am in Portland, Oregon, on the west coast of the U.S., yeah. And you've been around in developer relations for for quite some time um, with stints at uh, send grid and Zapier, I think yeah, amongst other yeah. places. And now you run a developer content company. Yes. Yeah. So every developer we work on with dev focused companies, help them create a better technical content strategy. As someone whose day-to-day work is primarily around bringing together the creative with the technical, I think this is an interesting book to to choose as your DevRel book club title. I'm keen to know how you came across this book and where you were in your career at the time. Yeah. What, what problem were you looking to solve? Yeah. Uh, and I should say, first of all, that this is like someone asks me for a book recommendation. This is the one I go to when you asked about book club it was the first one that popped into my head. Um, I discovered the War of Art at the exact moment that I needed it. I was maybe a month into writing a book. My first book, which was Map Scripting 101, about adding maps to your websites, Google Maps API, and, uh, and an open source abstraction library. And I was had that classic writer's block where... <laughs> Uh, I mean, every time I went to to type a sentence, I saw it printed in five thousand copies. Like in my head, that was what <laughs> that was what I saw, and that uh, that kept me from actually making any any progress on it. And uh, so, the War of Art is about overcoming feelings like that and <laughs> being able to uh, being able to do the work that you're meant to do. And, you know, I, uh, I think for DevRel who are watching this, that means the, all the DevRel activities that you do, right? Like it's a very, uh, you know, how, how rare the combination of skills are that you have. And, um, and so finding a way to be able to put those forth in the way that will have the biggest impact. I mean, that's, that's what I would wish for for you. And so I I read the War of Art now just about every year. Um, I find the format with the, the short little bursts kind of uh, easy to easy to get through and kind of meditative. I can even just sit and kind of read one and and think on it. Or uh, you know, often I think I'll read one and I just end up flipping pages because it's kind of so consumable in that way. And so it gives me inspiration. Uh, and I hope that if you choose to, to read it, and I know the two of you did, that you look for those, uh, those moments in it also. It's worth saying that what you mentioned there about the book being, would it be too much to say they're like Cohen's almost? Um, these little, and, and I'm going to give you an example here. You know, this is this is an example page, which you can just yeah. about see. Yeah, they're you know, quite that, short. That, yeah, there are there are shorter pages um, where it's giving you a few sentences on an aspect of the topic, and I think I understand what you're saying about flicking through it and just being able to almost use it as a jumping-off point. Would that be fair? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. So and in a way, stick- it kind of. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead. I was just gonna say, um, it kind of feels like it, it allows you to sort of also traverse it in in a in any order you want, especially if you've got these for, sort of these specific sections that really speak to you, that you can really go there and sort of use that as a as a jump, like like Matt said, like a jumping off point. Yeah. So Stephen Pressfield is a is a an author of both fiction and and, and factual works. Uh, you mentioned the phrase "do the work." I think he's even got a book with a similar yeah. title to yeah. that, hasn't he? <laughs> Um, and I, I think this came about because he was in a, in a stage of, of writer's block himself. And he started to write about the process that he was going through and he ended up with a whole load of notes and essentially asked an editor to help him turn that into a cohesive story. And so that, that kind of explains, I guess, the format, but you know, we can talk about the format as much as we want, but it's the content that we're here for. So mm-hmm. I want to talk through, I feel as though there are two, I don't want to be reductive, but there, there are two key takeaways from the book, I think. And obviously the, it, Stephen Pressfield dives into them and, 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 and expands upon them. But the first is this concept of, of resistance. So we talk about writer's block or about um, procrastination, things like that. Yeah. He calls it out as yeah. resistance. And for him, this is almost like a, a universal force, like gravity. It's there. Yeah. So w- what does that, that concept of resistance mean to you as someone who has sat there desperately trying to forget the impact of what you're doing and just actually get on with the work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's, I mean, going back to that time where I was working on the first book, I uh, reading through his definition of resistance, which you described the format takes, I don't know, 20 pages or something like that, right. Of, uh, <laughs> of kind of 20 maxims or, or whatever about what resistance is. Um, you know, it was describing exactly my experience in that moment. And I also could tie it to, you know, other things that's, that I had, you might call procrastination. One of the, I mean, he talks about procrastination also uh, separately, but that's one of the ways that it shows up. And uh, so it's, it is, like you said, a, a force, the way he describes it. So this outside force, I'd say it's kind of conspiring against our, our noble pursuits. Um and I'm not sure if that's exactly how he said it, but that's the way the way I get it. And um, certainly for DevRel, there's lots of content production, so you could take this straight away as, you know, like me writing a book. I didn't have to stretch to be able to <laughs> to get the points that he was making, right? Because he was he was writing about being an author. Um, but uh, but he does say that it it connects into many other other fields. Uh, he talks about uh, being an entrepreneur, you know, anything you want to pursue. Um, it talks about art a lot in it. And uh, I mean, we don't have to <laughs> have to dive deep into sort of DevRel as art, but uh, you know, I think that would make another, uh, a good topic for another day. Cause I think there's a lot of uh, things that, that would align there in a way that's, uh, that the engineering side of DevRel doesn't as much, though certainly there are those that make the the engineering is art um, uh, argument as well. Um, so yeah, there are. I think one of the big things for for DevRel uh, and to think about where resistance could show up is there are so many potential activities that you can do. <laughs> In, in DevRel, and you know you can't do them all, but there are times probably where resistance is showing up where you're off doing some time-consuming activity that is certainly part of your job, could be considered part of your job, but might not be the 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 noble pursuit, you know, the one that you know that you need to do. Yeah, and I think, I think there are a couple of things that I would, that I would 
like to highlight. Um, one is that developer relations is is even still now in 2022 is still a role where we don't have a a playbook a lot of the time. And so in DevRel, there's this, I think the resistance comes from the idea that not only do you have to do the thing, but a lot of the time you feel like you have to work out from first principles how to do the thing. Mm. And then there's the idea that you don't always know how to measure the impact of what you're doing. And so you don't know how people will react. And I think that, that for me anyway, can be a real source of, of what Pressfield calls resistance. The one thing that he talks about is resistance being the sense that you can't make a start because you are almost self-editing further mm-hmm. the, what you might be producing further down the line. So yeah. you're so petrified of not creating something good that you create nothing at all. Does that resonate with you? It does. And that's, I think the, that goes back to, to that seeing the printed book in my head as I was, as I was typing the very first draft blank documents, like there's a lot of steps between that and a printed book. And maybe I didn't realize all of them at the time that I had an editor that was going to catch errors and, uh, you know, folks that would make sure that uh, that the line that I pointed to in the code matched up with uh, with the reference that I made, right? Like all, all of those things. But I think what you're mentioning, the thinking through how, how are we going to track this and uh, you know, be able to point to this as a, a great success. Like th- those things are important things to think about at the beginning, making sure that you have some way to be able to do it, but not having that stop you from, from progress, I think is kind of the core message of, of the war of art is that when you think of those things as things that stop you from, from action, like that's, that's probably a sign that there's some resistance in play there. You know, this when and and when I was reading this book, this reminded this this very um this very part this very notion reminded me very strongly about um in, in my DevRel experience was was my nerves with public speaking and how I would be very nervous about going up on stage or very nervous about proposing a talk because you know I, I felt a sort of like you know something something um something holding me back and I called it nerves right. And I had a I had I I had a conversation with lots of de- uh, lots of DevRel folks about like or public speakers in general about like that that nerves and how it manifests itself and what they one what one person told me that really resonated made it, resonated with me and I felt it in, I felt it a, uh, in the book as well was this 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 notion of you're nervous because you care mm-hmm. yeah you know you're and, yeah. and if you can reframe that into excitement. You're excited yeah. because you care because yeah. you want to do a good job, and I felt I felt that very strongly with like you know those things that we care about, those things that we love, those things that we that we're passionate about. If we want, the more the better a job we want to do at them, yeah. yeah, it's gonna be harder to start, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that's uh, he writes about fear in there, and that's probably the part that the part of the book you're you're thinking of there, and and about yeah. how Henry Fonda apparently would be nervous before every performance throughout his whole career. Um, and yeah, and I've definitely felt I've been there on the, uh, the before getting on stage feeling. And uh, there's one in particular in my mind that I can remember watching the, maybe the two presentations before mine from the back of the event and thinking, I, I need to leave. I need to not, not be here. I like what would happen if I left and like really seriously considering that and thinking of that still as I was getting mic'd up and as I was, you know, backstage about to go. And at some point there it flipped to, okay, it's actually harder for me to leave than it is for me to go out there and, and give a great presentation. Right. Uh, I feel you. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've, 
come up with ways to be able to do that better. A lot of that has to do with remembering that audience that is there and that there, that's there, there are people in that audience who need to hear the message you have to deliver today and kind of going back to that as a way to be able to, um, to combat that, that feeling, <laughs> that feeling that I don't want to do it. Right. Yeah. Before we, we move on to the solution to resistance, I do want to, I kind of, I want to dive into it a little bit more because I feel as though if you can put a name to something, then it helps, but then really get into understand, put it into context is I think a way to help people start to recognize it. What does resistance feel like? So first unhappiness, we feel like hell. A low-grade misery pervades everything. We're bored, we're restless, we can't get no satisfaction. For me, that that kind of resonates with descriptions of burnout and depression as well. And he, he talks about depression somewhat as well. And I wonder, you know, if someone's feeling that way about their work in developer relations, then it could be that they have this problem of resistance, but but maybe not. You might have a good reason for feeling that way. Yeah, and i I think I think some of the the solution that that he talks about are some of the ways to know whether it is resistance or not. Right? If you have have done have done what you can <laughs> to be able to overcome this feeling and it's still there. This is, this is me talking. Maybe, maybe it's not resistance, right? I, I think that's, uh, and I bet we'll talk about this, you know, Pressfield would take that further and maybe uh, be a little less understanding, but <laughs> you know, I, I think there are definitely moments I have had them in roles that, uh, that just weren't a fit for what I needed them to be where um uh, where i i tried pretty dang hard and and then realized that you know the the problem wasn't me it was it was that it was the fit right and so whether that is a a role or whether it's um yeah uh, another pursuit that <laughs> that you have right now yeah for sure like i'm not a uh, i'm one that that takes some good from something that i read and am willing to uh, forgive it the the other thorns that it may have. So, you know, David Allen's getting things done. I have never created 43 folders in my uh, in my drawer, you know, for the 31 potential days in a month and the 12 months in a year and organized everything that way. I haven't done it, uh, you know, in folders and on my desktop either. But I have taken away things like you need to get the ideas out of your head so that they don't just keep rattling around that if there, if there's something you can get done in two minutes, do it. Otherwise it goes on a task list. Like those sorts of things I've taken from that <laughs> book while not needing to take all of it. So I think that's, that's the case here too, where, where uh, yeah, look for, look for the good that you can, can take from this, but yeah, it's not, it's not gospel. That's for, and I bet Stephen Pressfield would agree with that. Yeah, I think that context is the important part. So I'd love to dive into some of the slightly kookier parts of the book later. Yeah. But I still feel like we haven't really tied down how to recognize resistance. Yeah. So I think it's 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 important to acknowledge that sometimes resistance type feelings might be actual depression or burnout or something else that you perhaps need to address. But if someone's working in a DevRel role and all other things being equal, I guess half the battle is just being aware that this is a thing that happens and that's okay. And there are certain things you must do to overcome it. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and I think procrastination is probably the easiest thing to use to, uh, to describe kind of what it is when you see it. And, um, yeah, and that that recognizing that that's not 
Like one of the things that I like about it, about giving it this external name is that it's not some deficiency within you, right? <laughs> it's, it's that there's something that's attempting to, uh, to stop you from, from that noble pursuit. He talks about what he calls it professionalism. Uh, yeah. Uh, as a, as a way to overcome that. Um, and, uh, yeah, and to sort of the show up, show up, do the work, um, uh, and that's where I think it is dangerous to, uh, to to say that that's the only uh, the only thing to do, right? That that there could be a situation where where resistance is not actually the enemy here, um, but I think you don't really know that until you until you feel like you've actually tried right um and so uh and and so that show up do the work is really that's the simplified version of i mean there are many pages that he goes into and like you said another book uh called do the work um but it kind of comes down to to that and i think for for us in devrel it is looking for consistent progress on the things that are important. So um, now you have to identify the things that are, <laughs> that are important, but, um, but that consistent progress, I think is the key piece. And going back to my writing the book, that was what, I mean, obviously a book will never have printed words on it if you don't have a first draft, right? So that was the, at that moment, that was what I had to do. And it wasn't helpful to think of the the full breadth of 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 that project. And and that that whole part about like you know showing up every day and doing the work, it also reminds me a lot of like the community work we do or the personal branding work we do yeah. of you know showing up every day and being consistent about that. I like that mm -hmm. that can can kind of manifest itself in several different ways be it in our devil work or other kind of work otherwise. So I, I really, that really spoke to me. Yeah. And I, and I think that's, that's good seeing it as, as all of those activities that it, that it could be right. It's not, it doesn't have to just be writing, you know, that definitely is how it usually shows up for me. Um, but yeah, it's identifying those things that are important and really the important things done consistently are no matter what that those things are, are going to be where you're going to see larger results. Right. Let, let's dive into professionalization. Yeah. Pressfield talks about maybe setting aside specific hours, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But for us in developer yeah. relations, this isn't, we're not writing the next great novel, which means that for most of us, we're, getting paid in the context of a normal job. Mm -hmm. um, so, so professionalization almost feels like a, well, it comes with the territory, doesn't it? Well, and I think he even says that he says you're already professional in a lot of ways and sort of talks about if you, uh, if you have a job that maybe isn't your, um, your art, that's um, that you, that you show up, that you, that you do the work. Right. Um, and so I guess maybe what you're saying is that, uh, the waters are a little muddied in that as DevRel, our art is our job. Um, and certainly ours are, are much more inconsistent in, in DevRel, given that there might be events, there might be time zones, uh, but I think to say that that means that you can't have any any consistency, even a same time consistency, is uh, it's maybe maybe some there's maybe another example of resistance, right? That uh, that's uh, that you're saying, oh well, I mean, the schedule is so wacky that there's no way that I could carve time to do one thing at the exact same time every day, and I would argue that you probably still can. And maybe you don't hit it every day that you want to hit it, right? But you can still 
you can still do it in the majority of the days would be would be my guess for most people. Um, it's a bias for doing that thing and you have to decide yeah. not to do it rather than the other way around. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I think that it can also work at different times. It doesn't have to be the same time. He definitely talks about the same time. He talks about, you know, when does the muse show up at exactly 9 a.m. when <laughs> you pull out the typewriter or something like that. Right. Um, but uh but yeah, so I think I think that structure definitely for me that structure works better when there's sort of a a time frame. But I think the biggest part is the what you said, Matthew, about the bias toward doing it, and uh, you know, and and making it that that thing that you that you make the time for. As a younger person, I had a job for a while where I had to put pieces of metal into a machine, and they came out covered in plastic. And that was an eight hour shift every day and you knew what you had to do. And at the end of it, it was done in developer relations. I still feel like there's this, this huge fear of the blank page, whether, whether it's um, writing a blog post or giving a talk or even diving into a community and, and having to play that role and being the person who has the answers or at least has the, the map for where to go. Professionalization in that context, then what, what are some practical guidances that the three of us can give to people who are feeling that, who are suffering with this external force of resistance and want to use professionalization as a, as a means to overcome it? I, I, first of all, I think that we don't have to be the ones with the answers and some of, some of that like that feeling itself can be uh, sort of that's a, a little bit like imagining the completed book, right? Is uh, that if you have to be the one with the answers, then that is in a moment where you don't have the answers that can that can be intimidating. And so um, I think being okay to not not be the one with the answers is a is a starting place there. I think the classic like being okay with a rough draft or initial thoughts is another way and that and I'm I'm saying rough draft which is a writing term but that can be a presentation that can be you know um, an answer to to someone's question this feeds really well into something that Ramon's been doing for a while now which is the learning in public yeah um thank you uh this is something that that I feel pretty strongly about actually it's it's this this whole notion of of giving ourselves a good reminder that we all have gaps in our knowledge we all have places where we need to improve and we all need help with the with the things that eventually come out to be amazing um one thing i've been doing lately is is just putting a call out there to be like hey do you want to you know come on live stream with us and practice your talk or hey do you want to just I, i'm actually doing a live stream uh pretty soon about helping somebody in DevRel write up a proposal for a talk and sort of showing that that methodology online. And, and this is something that I find not, not just in DevRel, but in, in most of tech areas is, you know, having loads of experience doesn't mean that you can do everything on, at the fir- on the first try, you know? And, and, and that was something that was really eye-opening for me, um, especially when, when, when teaching programming, finding that, me getting stuck and showing my problem solving methodology was far more valuable than the answer to the problem I was solving to the learners. And I feel like that's something that, that, that we can bring over to our uh, daily work as well. You know, you know, when people are starting up with public speaking, for example, and you know, they're, they're afraid of the Q and a because they're scared that they might be asked a question that they don't know the answer to and how liberating it is to tell somebody, you know, you don't have to have that answer. In fact, a far more powerful answer is I don't know, comma, but let's find out. Like show them that that learning journey is something that I find really powerful. Yeah. And that, that feels like uh, for someone who's paralyzed to in action that, that, that should be, that should be freeing to, to be able to, um, yeah, admit that you don't know it all. Admit that uh, 
you know, that something isn't perfect. Um, and that's Matthew. I, I think at a couple of DevRel cons, I've talked about uh, planning content and creating a content calendar. And uh, one of those, you know, there's a couple of spots where, where I kind of gloss over uh, what might be the hard work. And I acknowledge that say, you know, write is the next step. Like you have to write this thing. Uh, and then one of them is click publish. And I think that that is often a huge barrier. Something might be essentially done. And all, all it requires is that you click publish. And yeah, there might still be some typos in it. And uh, if it's, you know, if it's a video, there might be something you say that where you sound foolish, but you know, you're, you're, if you don't click publish on it, you won't get a chance to do the next one and you won't get a chance to find out what people, what resonates with people about the one that you (laughs) need to publish right now also. Right. Like, so that kind of, uh, I, I find it's, it's practicing under editing, which might seem like, like the opposite of, of professionalism to some, which, which maybe is why that term might not fully work. That's why I think I like the sort of show up uh, uh, terminology better because yeah, under editing seems, oh, that's, that's unprofessional. But the reality is that, that you need to get, those cycles in and um, and that, that if you, if you wait for the one perfect thing, it, you won't get a chance to do that. Yeah. And perhaps there's a, something to be said for having a, a couple of people that you, you trust enough to, to show your, your work to at a stage where you're not confident in it. That's its own click publish, right? I mean, it's, so it's not, publish, but it's, you know, click share, right? Like (laughs) find, find some way to, to lower that, that barrier for you. I think one thing that's helped me a lot with that is, is to, is to ask for feedback from my colleagues. You know, it's kind of publishing, you know, I'm publishing it to my colleagues and being like, Hey, does, what do you think? And I think, you know, once you once once I reframe it less as me making myself vulnerable to my colleagues and you know potential to 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 criticism, but rather to reframe it as sort of like bouncing ideas, helping them helping them mold, um, really was really positive for me. There are some unusual aspects of this book that we we really do have to just touch upon. I think if you're going to buy this book and read it, then you might wonder why we hadn't mentioned it if we didn't. And Pressfield takes quite a a spiritual, religious viewpoint. You know, he, he, he goes to the extent of saying that if your creative endeavors are blocked, then that can lead to all sorts of outcomes that typically we would put down to bad luck or character flaws rather than saying that you didn't write your novel so you became a very bad person or got sick is is that something that you're able to separate from the parts that that you do draw value from yeah i do and we talked we touched on this a bit with the um you know with the the like the idea that you might actually have depression or you might be in a role that's a bad fit or, you know, that, that not everything is resistance. Um, yeah. The, the thing that, that I don't like about the book is if I think one could get the message that you just need to try harder. Like that's like any problem in your life. It's because you didn't try hard enough. And that's, that's not, what I take away from it. I, I take away that you, you should examine the, the potential reasons and, you know, say maybe, maybe resistance is playing a role here. Um, and, uh, but there are some things then that he, uh, that he says that's, uh, that I certainly don't, (laughs) would not endorse, right. Would not co-sign. I mean, even the, the forward author, yeah. Sa- says, 
uh, the the last third of the book, like, I don't really agree with this. Like, but then he says, but these are the things that I take out of it, right? So he doesn't agree with the with the angels and uh, the muse, and you know he he prefers uh, a a different interpretation of that, but he's able to still get some things out of it. And, uh, you know, so uh, Pressfield was when he was not writing novels and screenplays, uh, he, he was in advertising. And so I think one, of, you know, one of the things is the uh, what the ADHD is just a marketing term. Um, it's possible that he actually believes that, I think it might also be a little bit of an exaggeration for effect, but as a as a an ad man, right? I think he uh, he might actually believe some of that. Again, that that uh, doesn't have to mean that that's what we take from it. You know, I think my my statement there would be to to think through resistance as a possible reason. Uh, but recognize that it might not be for everyone, right? So, um, yeah, and and he definitely has like bold, gruff statements. I mean, one of his other books is called "Nobody Wants to Read Your Shit." Uh, so you know he's he's right there with those. So so certainly those are uh, um, are in there. Um, I I think the, there was there was a. A Hitler comment that might <laughs> that might have been one of the things you were thinking of is that yeah well I I, I seem to recall something about um, the general notion being that if Hitler had been able to pursue his art then perhaps he wouldn't have been one of the most evil psychopathic killers in history yeah um, and you know it, Hitler did a lot of paintings so I feel as though he probably did get that out of his system. So there are some things that I think it's just worth we mention this because if, if people go away and read this book as a result of us talking about it, they might be a little surprised at some of the content. And and that one in particular, he does say this might be an overstatement. And <laughs> I think it sounds like the three of us would say to Stephen Pressfield, yes, you're right. <laughs> but I, I mean, <laughs> overstatement I, I... might be an understatement. I have to admit, yeah, when I was when I was reading this book, there were some of these statements that were that were quite um, provoking, that I had to sort of t stop and take a step back. And if I were to rec and if I were to, you know, give, um, I, I would I would go as far as to give somebody a heads up that there are some statements in this book that, you know, are I don't know if problematic is the right word, but definitely something to look out for because yeah, they 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 kind of come out of nowhere. <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, you, you mentioned that I, I reread it. So you would think that I would come upon those often. I think, you know, one of the, one of the positive things about the, the format of the short bits is that you can kind of turn the page and see, see what's next. Right. And choose to, to kind of ignore that. And I, and I think that's probably what, what I've done, given that it didn't actually occur to me until we were talking about <laughs> that, that there were some of these things that you probably should give people a heads up on. So I appreciate that because it's a book I recommend often. So <laughs> now I can remember that there are, uh, there are some caveats to that. And I, and I think, you know, having, I think, you know, uh, giving a heads up of those caveats, I think is the best way to go about it because it, it, it allows us to, to, to bear in mind that the, of what what to expect uh, going in, because like you said, there are there are there are definitely it's it's I, ever since we've been talking about this today, I've been thinking about you know that that sort of separation of the good parts of the book that we can that we can take away, and I think that's very really important to bear in mind. Thank you. We can use that in our own work also, and acknowledging, I mean, those are, I would think, Stephen Pressfield's opinions. And uh, that that we also might have opinions about technologies we use and uh, you know other tools, right? That uh, that might also seem controversial in some circles. Um, I think 
it's okay to share those uh, because those are your opinions, right? But uh, but recognizing, yeah, that uh, that no one has to take uh, gospel from anyone, right? In developer relations, it is a creative field. There's a lot of technology in it, but also there's a lot of filling that blank page, whatever form that might take. As humans, we are naturally disposed to or subject to a force that makes it more difficult to achieve those creative endeavors. And the solution to that is just to get on with it. Yeah, you know, we, in the third part, in addition to talking about angels and muses, <laughs> he talks about the ego and the self as as separate things, and that when when you look at them as as too connected, that that is uh, that that can keep you from from that noble pursuit, right? When you kind of that's a little bit of what you were saying there of of like uh, worried too much about the outcome is really kind of about about your ego potentially. Um, but yeah, then to, to those, those that are, uh, have, have listened this far, uh, you know, I, chances are, you know, the activity that you'd like to do more of. Um, and so really the takeaway would be to, to try making that time for it, um, and find ways to identify the barriers that aren't real because there are barriers that are real and there are definitely barriers that are, that are imagined. Right. And so how can you find those, those imagined ones uh, that when removed, make it that much easier for you to consistently pursue that activity, you know, you want to do. I, I, I think, I think, yeah, I think that that sort of like balance and prioritization of what we want to do and how we approach that in a way that is, you know, healthy and balanced is something that, that I would say also is, is a, is a, is an important takeaway for folks. And, you know, when it, when it comes to having these conversations and, and reading these sorts of things, I, 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 this is something that I'm actually trying to do in my day to day as well is to sort of like tear down, tear down that barrier and tell everybody, Hey, you know, this is the transparency behind what I'm doing, how I can do it. You know, my my role, my my day job role is is part time. That I use the rest of my time to, to to do the other things I want to do. So it's not like I'm you know working on weekends. I learned a long time ago, and by a long time ago, I mean not that long ago, that you're not supposed to work on weekends because it's not sustainable. Um, yeah, and I think I think having that as a reminder on the day to day is is really important, and uh, I appreciate that we can have this conversation. And the crux, I think, of, of the whole conversation is that it's for each of us individually to be able to find those examples of where it's a, an internal hurdle we have to overcome versus something that perhaps needs some more reflection. There's a reason why I read it every year, <laughs> right? It's it's that it reminds me that that's uh, that it is that it is hard, but it, that it's uh, worth that pursuit. Cool. Well, Adam, thank you so much for sharing the war of art with us. Uh, where can people find out more about you and every developer and your book? Yeah, well, every developer.com is a good place to find, uh, find the book and find me and also on Twitter at Adam D 